Welcome to the Book Party Podcast. Join us as we journey into the world of books with Michael T. Prepare to be captivated by engaging interviews, insightful discussions, and fascinating stories. You'll discover new adventures and gain insight into the creative process of the authors themselves as they share their struggles and accomplishments. Now let's hear from Michael T. This is Michael T. and the Book Party Podcast. Welcome, dear listeners, to a podcast episode that will transport you to the enchanting and haunting streets of New Orleans where history and fiction intertwine in a mesmerizing dance today, we have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to an author whose storytelling prowess knows no bounds. Meet Ryan Winter, a French-Cajun wordsmith whose tales are as rich and diverse as the vibrant city he calls home. With a charming yet canted attitude, Ryan's love for New Orleans and his art of writing is renowned throughout the literary world. Ryan's journey into literature began with a captivating twist, a dare that horror writers couldn't cross genres. His first foray into the realm of creativity <laughs> led to the creation of New Orleans' Mother Goose, a children's picture book pinned under the name Ryan Adam. But that was just the beginning in his debut novel, Ravish. Ryan masterfully crafted a world where mythology intertwines with dark fantasy, LGBT themes, and an alluring touch of erotic. It's a testament to his ability to push boundaries and explore the depths of storytelling. And now, the piece de resistance Wake the Devil, this historic fiction masterpiece is based on the chilling and true story of the Axeman murders that sent shockwaves through New Orleans in 1918. With a narrative that spans generations, Ryan Winter takes us on a journey through time where a dusty manuscript and ominous nightmares intertwine with the city's dark past in Wake the Devil, we delve into the horrors of 1918, where Italian grocers fell victim to a relentless and seeming untraceable killer. To the terrified citizens, it felt like the devil himself had descended upon their beloved city. But a young hero, Serlito Mastriani, believes he holds the key to unmasking the Axeman and ending his reign of terror. His quest will reveal the killer's gruesome origins and uncover Truman Neuwirth's familial connection to one of New Orleans' most horrifying legacies. So, dear listeners, prepare yourselves for an unforgettable journey into the heart of New Orleans, where history and fiction meld, and Wake the Devil is a tale of suspenseful horror and intrigue that will leave you breathless. Join us as we sit down with the masterful storyteller, Ryan Winter, and delve deep into the pages of Wake the Devil to uncover the mysteries beneath the surface of this captivating novel. Stay tuned for an episode that will leave you spellbound. Now, Ryan, why don't you take it from here, fill in a bit of the blanks, and tell the listeners about yourself. Wow, uh, thanks for that amazing introduction, Michael. That's the best I've ever had. <laughs> I even want to go out and read the book. Uh, thanks for having me here on your show. Um, yeah, that's uh, I, I'm, I, those are actually three various different books, and I get uh, a lot of flack for that because, you know, two of them are horror and the other is children's book, but, you know, it, it just so happened to be that way. Um, you know, they're, they're very three different, radically different books, but they're – you know, their common theme is New Orleans, which is where I'm from originally. I um, I grew up in uh, about an hour south of the city. My dad's family's from New Orleans. So, you know, I was surrounded by a lot of people that love to talk and chat and, and you know, you know, drink on, you know. And, and there's a lot of folklore in that area that really inspired me to do this. So it's no accident I wound up choosing writing as a career, uh, given it's in Louisiana's history with 
piracy and, and, and voodoo and, you know, madness and mayhem, you know, all the good stuff. <laughs> right. So on your publishing journey, did you do any self-publishing route or did you have an agent, an agency route or something in between like a hybrid publisher? How did you go about your publishing? The first one, the New Orleans Mother Goose, the, the children's book, uh, the book that my, my mother says, that the little book that can, it just keeps on uh, getting noticed uh, even after all these years. Back in 2014, I had sent it out. It was published by a traditional publisher that's uh, local to New Orleans called um, Pelican Publishing. They had been, you know, they've been in business for decades and they're very famous for their uh, local children's books and things like that. And I had sent it out to them almost like a dare you know i really i really wasn't in the you know in the market to do children's books but uh you know i i have a couple of their own authors and you know a couple of pelican books that i've always had you know we always do down there you know they're like i said they're very very popular and uh i sort of did it on a dare from friends and you know i said well you know i'm gonna write a children's book i think off you know once an author always an author it doesn't matter if you write horror or not i think you can pretty much you know cross genres and uh, sure enough, it had gotten traditionally published by uh, Pelican, um, and uh, they, they were really great. They embraced the project, and, you know, the next one was I knew was not I was not going to follow it up with a kid's book, so I had a feeling that they probably would <laughs> take my next book, um, which was actually a, an original version of Wake the Devil. I had um, published a sort of a, a smaller version of it, and... Uh, of course, they, you know, they, I don't think they understood what it was about, and I don't think they understood my vision for it. And a lot of writers, you know, in New Orleans, because, you know, a huge, huge population of artists and writers and everybody helping each other, New Orleans is just that kind of place. And, uh, you know, a lot of them kept saying, you know, why don't you self publish? Why don't you self publish? And it's something I never really thought to do. And uh, so the, so that first, um, version of Wake the Devil had been published uh, back in around 2018, and I went through a Vanity Press, Lulu Press, um, which, which was nice. It was fine. Um, uh, you know, after you know, hanging, you know, being with them for about a year or so, I didn't find I had as much control as I thought. And then, of course, you know, Create Space became Amazon KDP. And it just, that formula got better and better. So a lot of people were switching over to that. And, you know, that's what I did with Ravish. You know, when Ravish came around, I knew that's where I wanted to put it. Um, again, I had sent it off to different, different publishers. And, you know, after so many rejections or so, and the time is ticking, you know, you don't want to publish it, you know, 30, 40 years down the road. So, you know, using uh, Amazon KDP as an outlet to get it done. You know, because it had it, been stewing for a couple of years, as did, you know, Wake the Devil. And um, and I find it a great experience. You know, you, you, you do have a lot more control over it. You do have to do your own marketing, which is fine. I don't I don't mind that at all. And I, I think that's the big thing about self-publishing is if you really want to go far with it, I mean, you really have to put yourself out there. You know, you can't sit back and let it just sell itself. And uh, so, you know, and I've always had a great relationship with them. And so, you know when the idea of coming back to Wake the Devil to revise it into an original that I want it to do um, is what's published now, which I published a few months ago. So uh, I've kind of had my hand in, 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 uh, in all three, <laughs> you know, to, to find top it off. Well, you know, I, I wrote my first three books. I self-published them. I'm working on number four now, and I'll nice. self-publish that under KDP as well. And like you said, yeah. you got to do the marketing, and and I'm not afraid of that. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. I'm just gonna take it that way. On this current book that we're talking about, take us to a point that you would consider your worst author moment when you're writing this book. Because wake, the nature, I think, of Wake the Devil is historic fiction. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of details. There's a lot of research into it. And the thing is, when I first started in a research for Wake the Devil, when the idea came to me, this is back in 2004, um, you know, there was very little information released at that time. And so I think in my first version, there was a lot of facts that I found out later on 
that, oh, this is what happened. Oh, it wasn't this, it was this, you know, and I think those kind of, that's kind of frustrating. But also, too, again, it's the nature of it, you know, the the research I had done was strictly through, you know, police records, um, newspaper records at that time, which is kind of the point of why I wanted to, uh, the point of view of the book is mostly through the citizens' point of view, because that's what they saw. They read the papers. They heard what the police said, and this is how they knew what was going on with the Axeman murders and all that. So that's kind of the point of the book. But it, there's so many times where I was frustrated where, you know, the, one newspaper said, you know, he was 46 and his last name was spelled this way. And then the other newspaper said, oh, no, he was 29. And <laughs> so to do something that's historical fiction, you try to get it as correct as possible. But, man, Michael, it's, it's frustrating when you you learn new information even after you finish the book it's it's kind of a pain to go back and figure that out so you kind of just do the best you can with what you got i guess yeah i guess so well flip the coin a little bit and let's go with what we call the epiphany moment where you're not actually writing the book but you're doing something else it could be taking a shower it can be taking a drive it can be cooking or having a beer and all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off in their head. It's like, oh, wow, I got to get a pen and a paper. I got to write this down right now so I don't, it doesn't degrade, you know, the thought. Do yeah. you have a moment like that? You know, that's, it's, this probably can, it would be considered a, in a, um, epiphany moment. I, you know, I started the book back in 2004 as a script and it just kept, the more research I, I, I did, it, the more it kept going. So it got bigger. I said, well, I have a book here. And um, years later, I had picked it back up again. You know, Katrina happened. Everything got put on pause. So after, you know, a couple of years later, I'm, you know, I pull it out of a drawer again. I said, you know, I think I'm ready to write this book. You know, I think there's something interesting here. And on the first night, I remember um, I was having crazy, crazy, you know, nightmares that someone was after me. You know, and, and to me, every time I started the first chapter, these weird things would start happening. But I think the real moment for me when I realized, like, oh, I've got to finish this. I don't know if I can do it tonight because I'm, you know, I've spooked myself. But there was a couple of moments I tried to start back on the book. And uh, the one, the more memorable one, I can remember it was back in um, around 2015 in January. And, and New Orleans doesn't get terribly cold, but uh, it was very cold that night. I remember ice hitting the windows and things like that. And I was by myself and my roommate was at work and, and this is at night and uh, it started back on the book again. And I'm telling you, I got this really eerie feeling, you know, and I felt like, God, what if the ax man himself is watching me right now, you know, write his bio, <laughs> you know, and, and we're just waiting for me to slip up. And sure enough, I, I halfway through a few paragraphs and I can hear a, a dragging sound on the porch and it, it, it it kind of spooked me out. And all I kept thinking to myself was sounds like an ax, <laughs> the metal of an ax, you know, mm -hmm. scraping against the cement porch. And I think at that moment I said, man, you know, I think this is going to be a really good, <laughs> you know, if I can, if the author is scaring himself trying to, you know, belt this out, then there's something there. So from then on, I always had this, um, I guess this deep respect for the material because I kept thinking, man, the ax man's watching, you know, he's, he's telling me you better not screw up winner. You better not screw up <laughs> telling my story. Yeah. So yeah, there, there was a couple of instances I felt like, you know, okay, this, 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 this might be something after all, you know? <laughs> yeah. No kidding. So let's, let's go to today. What is the one thing that you are fired up about, excited about today, right now? Oh, I am actually working on a fourth book right now. And I'm, I, I, it's, again, it's one of those stories that's been eating up inside me for so long and I finally have the time to do it. Um, I'm really excited about it. It's, 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 you know, it's not to give too much of it away. It's sort of a sci-fi, it's sort of a biting satire on, um, the day, uh, the gay dating world today and the dating apps and things like that. So, you know, it's something I've been wanting to do and I'm really, really excited about it. You know, I, I, I tend to out, I do a general outline in my book. So I have an idea what it's going to happen, what's going to happen and all that, but it's in the moment when you're writing, you know, that you find this little magic, like, Oh man, this is great. This is great. So it really makes you want to get up in the morning and say, okay, I can't wait to get back to this again. So um, I have that and, and, and that there's a book behind that I'm actually excited about starting on too, but 
you know, I try to do two books at a time and, oh my gosh, it's, it's a nightmare. But so <laughs> following you're one about, by You talk about cross genres, man. You're the guy that's crossing them all. It's so crazy. You know, I, when I was a kid, I never thought in a million years I'd do historic fiction or um, LGBT for that matter. Um, that it, it's, they always seem to find me. I don't find them, you know, uh, when I was a kid, it's all I was all into Stephen King and, and Anne Rice. And, you know, of course, Anne Rice is native New Orleanian herself. Um, but it, it was always something I wanted to do. So when the kids book came out, I'm like, well, this is something. But, I'm, you know, if you go into my room, into my library, you see, you know, books like My Roll Doll next to, you know, Clyde Barker. And <laughs> next to him yeah. is you know, sell Silverstein. So, you know, it's, uh, I have a very eclectic amount of books. So I guess, you know, the sky's the limit, man. If you're going to write, just write, <laughs> write everything. Yeah, you know? There you go. Well, this is Michael T. We invite you to go to bookpartypodcast.com. Hit that subscribe tab on top. Scroll down to the icon of your choice, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or Odyssey. You can find us and download us there, and please leave a review. And please don't forget to sign up for our video newsletter. Get the latest information for our upcoming shows. Now, Ryan, we're going to enter the lightning round. The lightning round is four-pointed questions for four-pointed answers. Before you ever became an author, before you wrote your first book, what kept you from becoming an author in the first place? Time, time, uh, work it, working, you know, nonstop doing a lot of overtime, doing normal jobs. That's, that's what really, it, it puts a damper on, on the time you have to, to actually set aside to write. Okay. Well, what was the best advice once you started writing, what was the best advice you had ever received? There was, there was, and this actually um, happened when I was a young teenager, when I first started doing it, that I, uh, more than anything, I wanted to be a screenwriter. I wanted to be a writer of any kind, but screen at that time, screenwriting was my thing. I had walked into uh, um, an accountant's office in downtown New Orleans, just little, little 13 year old me. And, you know, I walked in there and he sure enough, this, this accountant saw me and I went in there because I had questions, legal questions about contracts and all that. And he told me, you know, we were talking, he asked me what I was writing about and all this other stuff. And uh, he says, um, you know, I, I said, I never know if anybody's going to like what I write. And he said, Mr. Winter, you can write about pie and someone's going to read that book. He said, don't ever think that no one's going to read your book because someone will, you know. Uh, you can write about anything. So there's going to be an audience for it. And that's one of the first, um, you know, advice I ever got when I was younger. It's always stayed with me. Yeah, that's, that's true. You know, there's going to be an avatar for something. As long as it's coming from you, there's going to be an avatar for it. Right. You write true. true. If you want, yeah. You know. Yeah. Share one of your personal habits that contributes to your success. You got to get up and do it. You know, a lot of writers are cleaning their office for two or three hours before they even sit down and write a line. The best advice is uh, put the butt in the seat and go. You know, it's not going to get done if you don't. You know, it, it, we, we imagine things and we want we want it to magically appear, but not until you sit down and do it. You know, and I, it's, for me, when I finally do, you know, take my own advice and I do sit down, off I go. And I don't get up until it's done. But right. to finally down and say just sit down and do it stop stop mingling in the background you know okay can you share with our listeners an internet resource that you use when you write hmm that's a really good question michael um i'd have to i you know i use youtube a lot YouTube has a lot of fun stuff. They, there's so much different creativity on there that I always, even if I spent 10 minutes looking through YouTube videos, and I love all the spooky stuff. I watch all the ghost things, all the paranormal things. I always find something fascinating that I didn't know before. And it almost, you know, you know, 8 out of 10, I usually wind up coming away with a short story idea. <laughs> it's on something I kind of saw. Okay. And I'm a well, YouTuber. Ryan, we- 
<laughs> You're YouTube crazy, huh? Well, Ryan, we're going to enter into the grand finale. In the grand finale, I want you to take your time and tell our listeners about your book. Mm -hmm. Wake the Devil, um, just a quick uh, little surmise how, how it came about. I, um, you know, I lived in the French Quarter my whole life, so I'm surrounded by a lot of crazy stories and things like that. And I came across the story of the Axeman through books about haunted history in New Orleans. And, you know, a lot of those, you have to kind of give and take because some of it, it's like, what? No, that didn't really happen. And I think, you know, I always saw him as sort of a footnote in all these books. So it intrigued me. I said, that, you know, he's one of those stories I read that said, God, did that really happen? And I had asked a lot of um, older locals if they even heard about this, you know, and, oh, no, I never heard the Axe Man. And, you know, this is back in 2004. And, and now there's there's a lot of stuff about him, but back then there wasn't anything. And there was just something so intriguing about it. And this guy, uh, May 23rd, 1918, um, this Italian family, these these seemingly great citizens, no enemies whatsoever, you know, this couple was uh, massacred in their bed behind their grocer. And it shocked the city. Because it wasn't just like some regular, you know, kill. This was a slaughter. And that was just really, even for New Orleans, that was too much. And there was just a lot of intriguing things about it. You know, um, at that time with the police and all that, you know, they didn't, fingerprinting had just started. In fact, it was even laughed at by, by the force. They didn't even want to use it. So a lot of that stuff was instinctual. And, you know, of course, the DNA, I mean, that's way off. And, but there was little things that the police noticed that was kind of odd about this guy. You know, he would chisel out the back doors of these victims in, in, you know, and he would do it, you know, in such a way where he couldn't fit through and they couldn't understand how can a large man fit through these, these panels, you know, he wasn't reaching in and grabbing keys. I mean, these doors were locked, but, um, and that was the only thing he really left behind besides the ax itself, which he used, um, on his victims, but the axe always belonged to the victims. I thought that was really sick. And I'm like, that's crazy. He used their own axe against them. And he wouldn't even behind him, but that was all his MO for a while. And they, they just couldn't understand it. And there was a message on, on, um, which I thought this was really cool. Um, written in chalk on, on the sidewalk during the first murder. And it had something like Mrs. Maggio is going to sit up tonight, just like Mrs. Tony. And nobody knew what it meant. And so the lead um, chief of police at that time, his name was Frank Mooney, and you'll see him throughout the book. He's, he's one of the main characters. You know, he started to piece together that just 10 years prior to 1918, there was similar murders. And it was, again, Italian grocers mostly. And, of course, it was all written off as, as the mob, which was a big thing at the time, of course. You know, it's the first thing they thought of was uh, the Black Hand Group, which was this, you know, uh, version of the mafia. And, but then he started reading the message and the Mrs. Tony in the message referred to some, one of the victims back then. So it was very bizarre. It's all these weird little revelations, but they, they really couldn't piece it together. And then, you know, the, the city's kind of in the panic because they're already edgy. I mean, this is during World War I, for God's sake, you know, the city's already edgy. And uh, all of a sudden the next victim, you know, a couple months later is not an Italian, but a grocer. And the same thing happened. He, they were, you know, a couple. Uh, they were axed by their own axe. They were, you know, chopped up by their own axe. Um, both of them lived, yet neither of them could describe what the axe man looked like. And I think that's when I really jumped on it is because, you know, you have – he's face-to-face -face with one of these victims with, with the wife in that, in, that, in that particular case, and she couldn't describe him. And she kind of almost described him as faithless. And I thought that was really intriguing. And I'm like, well, here he is, and yet you still can't describe him. So this just added more intrigue to the case. And, you know, the city is just going nuts. You know, they're, they're um, barring up windows and, you know, sales of guns went through the roof and, <laughs> you know, the shutters and, and were being built on doors that didn't normally have shutters. So it, it really created this panic. Well, from then on, from that case on, it just got really weird because now all of a sudden he was just sort of attacking random people and uh, didn't matter if they were Italian or, or grocers. And and then he did some as well. Um, there were just cases where these police thought they had a suspect, you know, in tow and they would shoot guns at him and things like that. And he wouldn't even go down. 
and the police chased one suspect that actually jumped over a 10-foot fence. So all of a sudden, in secrecy, these police were starting to whisper, this wasn't a man at all. You know, this might be something more than what we can handle. You know, and even, you know, mob bosses were coming to the police asking for protection. So, I mean, that's <laughs> until you were there. You know, this is something, you know, out of the ordinary is going on. And, you know, that, that there it sort of sort of ended, you know, World War I ended in November and there was no killings up until 1919. Again, they, they breathed a sigh of relief, you know, there are no more killings for like four or five months straight. Well, in March, um, around March 9th, 10th, an Italian grocer was attacked on the other side of the city in the suburb of Gretna, which was a very, very small, I mean, it's a big, you know, it's a big area now, but a very, very small village type area. And again, same thing, you know, um, an Italian couple axed um, the the wife in that case. Her name was Rosie Cordemelia. These were the Cordemelias. This case became became huge, you know. And this part of the book I, is really interesting to me because um, Rosie, you know, the wife in that case, blamed you know this unfaced villain again this no face villain and then she sort of started blaming her husband so she couldn't get her story straight then you know she started accusing the people that found them in the night which was their neighbors it um the giordanos and they were sort of the rival grocer down the street so all of a sudden it's almost as if she took this opportunity to pin it on them which she did which she did very successfully and even though there was no proof that these four guys this young man named Frank Giordano's big, big guy. And he's barely 16, 17. And then his father, who's, you know, you know, 68, this old man who can't even speak English. And nobody believed that, but yet the courts did. They believed her testimony. And sure enough, they wanted to hang uh, Frank and, and put the elder Giordano in jail. And um, they almost, you know, that it almost happened. Um, till finally later on, she finally admitted she had no clue. And, and it, it really tore her world apart when she finally admitted that she lied. And it was a big thing. You know, there were protests erupting all over New Orleans, um, Catholic churches being vandalized. I mean, people just couldn't believe it that she would do this. Well, in the midst of all this, one of the most interesting aspects of the story happens. The Axeman himself decides he's going to speak. And he sends a note, very a la Jack the Ripper. <laughs> this is what I love about it. Um, he sends a note to the newspaper at the time, the Times-Picayune, which was the big paper there. Um, and he's basically giving them a decree. And he says, this is who I am. I'm from this cocktail place. And, you know, and he says, look, here's the deal. Next uh, Tuesday, um, I'm going to pass through New Orleans. And I, I'm I'm very fond of jazz music. So here's the thing. If no one's, if there's anyone, anyone in the city not playing jazz music, they will get the axe. So, of course, you know, next Tuesday, it's the loudest night in, in New Orleans history, man. Like, everybody's playing music. They're freaking out over this guy. And it's funny because the more research I did, a lot of people thought it was a joke. You know, you had a lot of people thought it was funny. A lot of people was, of course, obviously frightened to death. You know, um, there was advertisements in, in the local uh, grocery uh, chain supermarkets called the Piggly Wiggly that they would advertise, you know, little things like, um, you know, we're slapping sales just like the Axeman would and things like that. And people didn't thought that. Some people thought it was cute. Some people were just appalled. So, of course, you know, in New Orleans fashion, they're going to take this, you know, they're going to make a, a, a pageantry out of it. Uh, even a local uh, musician named um, Joseph John DeVilla composed this cute little um it's almost like a ragtime ditty and you can look it up on youtube if you want it's uh called the axeman's jazz don't scare me papa and it's the most kind of upbeat almost you know ragtimey piece you would never think was dedicated to a murderer and again a lot of people thought that was in poor taste you're writing this music you're selling it and this guy's killing everybody but yet we're celebrating him with this piece of music and so the night of that uh that tuesday when he came over you know every Band is playing. Band sales went through the roof. Instrument sales went through the roof. Um, even Davila himself would play his uh, composition on a piano while on a cart going around the French Quarter all night. <laughs> I can't get that image out of my head. That that's that's insane. That's so New Orleans, though. I mean, that that doesn't surprise me. But uh, sure enough, you know, the next day there were no reports of any murders. So whether he did it or he came or not, or <laughs> you know. 
um, even a fraternity from uh, Tulane University, one of the big universities in, in the city, had even gave him an invite to one of their parties. And, uh, you know, they said, look, you know, we know you're fond of breaking down doors. We'll keep the doors open for you. Come to our party. Now, you know, whether he came or not, you know, who knows? Nobody knew who he looked like. Um, so it, 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 it was just this big, big thing. And in the mean, you know, after all this is going on, there's a couple of trials um, from the uh, the second murder case, the Bessemers, that there, there was a huge trial then, and there was the huge trial with the Court Amelias and Giordano. So it was consistently in the news. And the attacks didn't stop. You know, until about October, and there was one last slaughter. It was a uh, um, uh, an Italian man, a grocer named Mike Pepitone, and his wife Esther. Uh, he flat out kills Mike, and Esther, who was with her children in the next room, survived. And once again, you know, she can't d- describe who the assailant was. And she, in fact, she even says there were two people there. And then she changes her story, and she says, "Oh, there was only one person there," and the guy was you know, tall and thin. And then, you know, a few weeks later, she's saying, oh, no, it was large fat man. And so, again, no one can know. And all of a sudden, you know, after that time in October 1919, it completely stopped. And that was it. He ne- he never came back. There was never another axe killing. And there's one little interesting note that's not really mentioned. I, I kind of mention it, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the victim, the last victim, Esther Pepitone, um, the widow of Mike Pepitone, um, she moved to Los Angeles a few years after that, around 1921. And she swears up and down she knew the identity of the axe man, this guy named Joseph Mumphrey. And this guy has been through so many different names. And again, and I doing research, it was so hard to keep track of who was who. You know, everybody, names were being misspelled. I mean, this is, you know, there's no internet. Nobody knows what, you know, they're just going off you know, testimonies and things like that. Wendy, who she um, claimed this man came for her and that she knew who he was. And she actually shot him on a, on a, New Orleans, um, a Los Angeles sidewalk down in, in um, December 5th, 1921. So it, it was that the accident. We don't know, you know, she was convinced, but, and that's the end of the story. I mean, that's, you know, there was never an incident like that again. So, you know, basically you had this guy who came in the night, you know, early 1918 and for a full year, just, terrorize New Orleans. You know, it was, it's absolute chaos. Kind of like the, you know, the American Jack the Ripper, as I say. And some people even thought he was Jack the Ripper. They thought he left London and came to New Orleans. So, again, you know, another little tidbit <laughs> that couldn't yeah. be substantiated. So, Well, Ryan, we thank you so much for being here with us today and opening up to us. I'm yeah, sure our listeners it. appreciate this, too. Again, uh, this pre- is Michael T., To all our listeners, I would invite you to go to bookpartypodcast.com, hit that subscribe tab on top, scroll down to the icon of your choice where you can find us on one of your favorite platforms, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or Odyssey. You can download and follow us there. Please leave a review. Don't forget to sign up for one of our video newsletters and get the information on our upcoming shows. Book Party Podcast is owned and powered by MPM Legacy Publishing, LLC. This is Michael T. Powering Off. You must not miss our next episode as we delve into a world of inspiration, entertainment, and thought-provoking insights. Join Michael T. on the next Book Party Podcast and experience a new adventure, a new story, and a complete immersion into the world of Pages Unveiled, Chronicles of the Writing Journey.